All right. I am going to get started. I just want to thank everybody for coming today. Um, this is our very first session for quarantine racism in schools, strate strategic planning. And today's session is going to focus on improving diversity in South Plainfield Public Schools. And so just a little bit about me, I'm the author of a book titled Promoting Positive Racial Teacher-Student Classroom Relationships, Doctor Degree in Educational Leadership from Rowan University, 2008, 24 years in education, racial equity consultant for 12 years and counting. I've written seven racial equity books, five marriage books, and I also have a uh, racial equity course that has been approved by Pear University. Well, I mean, approved by uh, Pennsylvania Department of Education, and it is a 12 week course. And so at the end of the uh, session, we're gonna talk about a contest we're gonna have, and it's gonna be a weekly contest. And I'll let you know that, know about the rules at the end of this session. And so I wanna talk about the South Plainfield School District scenario. I was reading an article and it was titled, Residents, District Leaders Discuss Efforts to Improve Diversity in South Plainfield Schools. And it was written by Victoria Caruso. And so in the article, the South Plainfield parents, they were asking questions about the school's professional development plans to improve race relations. And so what happened was after we had the, um, after we had the um, Black Lives Matter uh, summer demonstrations, that entire community, they sent letters to the school district and they wanted to know what their plan was. They also wanted to know why they did not include parents in the High School Culture and Climate Committee. Uh, they wanted to know why there was no focus on Hispanic Heritage Month. And then they had some concerns about the school district's cultural and heritage day. There you go. So when I think about this scenario, um, the question becomes, what do, what would you do? Or as a parent um, of a black child, what would you do in this scenario? And so the first thing we have to talk about is we have to talk about how parents, black parents should approach the school board I'm gonna talk about the advantage that New Jersey parents have. I'm gonna provide a strategy for a better understanding of individual biases of school staff, as well as the needs of the students and community. A little bit about culturally responsive teaching, the cultural climate committee, and then the curriculum initiative that the school district wanted to put in place. And so, one of the things that happens when a when a parent or a black when a black parent is enraged about racism in schools and they approach the school board they need to attack them from their vision perspective and what this does is it sets the tone for getting the school officials and the school board members to begin to side with you and so when I went to the website, this was actually the vision of the South Plainfield Public Schools. It says students are the focus of South Plainfield Public Schools. We provide a dynamic, rigorous, relevant, and technology-enriched curriculum guided by the New Jersey student, lear student learning standards. And it goes on to talk about their mission, which is to develop lifelong learners who are prepared to succeed in a global and diverse society. It goes on to say, we are resolved to educate the whole child, instilling the desire within our students to question and to become divergent thinkers who can achieve their fullest potential. 
And so this was developed in March of 2017, which was three years ago. So if I was approaching them and I wanted to approach them as a black parent about some racial incident or racism in schools, I would say, my name is Dr. Campbell. And I would say the Southfield Public Schools has a vision where students are the focus. And then like your school district, I have a focus on my child. And I am here to speak to you today about the focus of your professional development plan. And so when you take this approach, this does not alienate the school board members. You don't wanna alienate the people who are charged with taking care of your children. And so we know this works because first of all, let me give you an example. Uh, Martin Luther King, he used the same concept when he did his I Have a Dream speech in uh, 1963. And when he began his speech, he said, I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. And at that time, 250,000 people, first of all, had joined as a demonstration and they had joined as a rally for jobs and freedom. And so from the onset, he made a connection with them. And this is what has made his speech, well, this is what I believe has made his speech so powerful because he began by making that connection. I also have had a personal experience with connecting with uh, potential oppositional audiences. And I don't know if you remember in March of 2010, somebody was at a Walmart, it was Turnerville, Turnersville Walmart, and they went on the speaker and they said, attention Walmart customers, all black people leave the store now. Well, of course there was a big uproar in the community and the Gloucester County uh, NAACP got involved. And at that time, I was the vice president of the Gloucester County NAACP. And when we sat down and talked about how to approach Walmart, one of the things that I discussed with them is that you need to line up your vision with their vision. And the outcome was after that, Walmart started sponsoring all of the uh, Gloucester um, NAACP events. And so I know that this approach works. And so what we do a lot of times as black parents is we're so infuriated with racism in the schools that we approach them and we, I believe we lose them even in the beginning because of the approach we use. And so this is a different type of technology that I know that should be used. And so let's, um, and so, you know, school boards, administrators and teachers, when you approach them this way, they become automatically defensive. And people, when they become defensive, it's because they're either embarrassed, they feel threatened, and they're upset about the racial allegation. And so you need to take that defensive mechanism off the table so that you can get them to do what they want to do. And these are actually components of a uh, dysfunctional organization. And in a dysfunctional organization, people are less likely to cooperate. And that's why I recommend that strategy. And so in New Jersey, so this is my second point. In New Jersey, actually New Jersey parents have an advantage. New Jersey has administrative codes which uh, school districts are required to follow. And so, According to NJAC 6A71.6, what it essentially says is that each school board must provide training for all school personnel on a continuing basis to identify and resolve problems associated with the student achievement gap, gap and other inequities arising from prejudice on the basis of race. And so if you are a Black parent and you are having challenges with racism in schools in New Jersey, you really need to remind them that this is a statute that they must follow. 
Now, one of the things that I had started doing was I started going to the different school board meetings and reminding them of this statute because I was concerned about the achievement gap and how it wasn't closing in New Jersey. And shortly thereafter, the, the former commissioner, he came out with a letter and I actually saw the letter and he actually said that school districts have to follow this protocol um, or else they can lose funding and no school district wants to lose funding. So one of the robot blocks that they will put in front of you is they won't give you the information of what they're doing because they're not, they're probably not doing anything. And so as a New Jersey parent, you can also use the Open Public Records Act. It's called the Oprah Act. And you can actually ask them for that information. You can ask them for their professional development plan, and then you can examine it to assure, ensure that all the school personnel are being trained. And that includes custodians, that includes food service workers, that includes secretaries, because the statute says all school personnel. Um, and so you can check that. And then if you don't get that information, of course, you can take it now up to the commissioner and then you can take it to the New Jersey State um, Board of Education. I sincerely believe that if we're going to make a difference and if we're going to get the transformation that we need in these schools, this type of statute needs to be a requirement of each state. And New Jersey is well in front of the curve. We just have to make sure that they're following that protocol. And so in the article, they also talked about understanding the individual biases of school staff and the needs of the students and community. Now, first of all, one of the complaints that the parents had was they were not including parents. And then they were conducting a book study. They were reading some type of book and they were sitting around and they were talking about the, the cultural emphasis in the book. Now, if you are going to understand people's individual biases, then what you really need to do is you need to ask them to conduct a case study. And a case study is going to give you an in-depth analysis and a description of any allegations of racism in those schools. It's also going to give you what the individual biases are. It's going to include the needs of the students, and it's going to give you student um, reflections and feedback, and you also would include the community. And so that involves, first of all, individual interviews of parents, students, and teachers. And because we know that the two indicators of racism in schools is classroom achievement and disproportional uh, school and classroom disciplinary infractions, those should be the focus of the case study as well. And so that's the part of the strategic plan that they need to employ. So they also talked about uh, culturally responsive teaching. Now, culturally responsive teaching is a pedagogy that recognizes the importance of including students' cultural references in all aspects of learning. The problem that I have with this is it's been around for 26 years. And the result that we have is we still have black students, both boys and girls, who are receiving more out of school suspensions. And then we still continue to have a student achievement gap between whites and blacks at the fourth grade level, at the eighth grade level, and at the 12th grade level. And if we still have these challenges, then why are we still doing those same things? And so that's one of the questions that need to be brought to their attention when it comes to culturally responsive teaching. It's, you know, it's almost like they say the sign of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and then expect different results. And essentially that's what they're doing. And so as a black parent, you need to challenge that. And you need to challenge it from the perspective that it's not working and it's not working because it's been around for 26 years. So it's already proven that it's not working. 
And so they also talk about the Cultural Climate Committee. First of all, the Cultural Climate Committee lacks what I call depth. It only includes students, teachers, and administrators. And that's problematic because teachers and administrators are the power brokers who are serving the students. And so, for example, if they don't agree with a student, they could remove the student from out of the group, or they could just not listen to the student's opinion or, or not become sensitive to the student's needs. Um, they could shut down the student's ideas. And, and, it, and it makes sense because the students, they don't control the school budget, and they also have a limited time of input because of the limited time of the school day. And so they need to have parental input and participation to protect the students. And whatever they discuss needs to be driven by the results of the case study. And they need to focus on problem solving. And so they also talk about curriculum initiatives. And what they said was they wanted to include the works and contributions from people of color across the board. And so I have a problem with that term. And I have a problem with that term because you can go to the beach and sunbathe and become a person of color. You, <laughs> that's funny. You could come from India and be, and, and be considered a person of color. And so one of the things that we need to ensure is that they don't define the perimeters of who needs what. We need to make sure that when they're speaking to us, they're speaking to us as either Blacks or African-Americans. Otherwise, for example, when, they, when you use a term people of color, you dilute the focus on us as Blacks and African-American people. Also, instead of focusing on bringing in textbooks and books written by other authors or people of color, we need to focus on the language of curriculum materials. I was talking to my aunt the other day and, and God bless her heart, she's 86 now. I think she's 86 or 85, one of those two. And we were kind of having this same discussion and she said that there are, I think she said there were like 86 synonyms, synonyms associated with the term black. And what happens is in our curriculum materials, you find those negative associations. And so if you're gonna do, if you're gonna focus on curriculum, let's focus on the language that makes the, the term black or the color black negative. Okay. They should also focus on cross content area projects. And so what normally happens is, let's say, for example, uh, Black History Month comes. And so Black History is only taught either during social studies time for the younger people or in the social studies class. Or they may have a group and they may have a dinner and celebrate um, the different types of food. What they need to do and what they should do, and you can ask them to do, is, for example, if they're going to do a uh, project that emphasizes Martin Luther King, well, it should be included in math, it should be included in science, the uh, what we call the related arts, Spanish, physical education. It should be included across the board so that the children know that Martin Luther King is important in every area. And so finally, I, I, I thank you for your attention and I wanna talk a little bit about the contest. Now we have a contest um, where if you submit a topic and we use it during the next week, we will send you a free t-shirt. And as you can see, the t-shirts, the, the, the pink t-shirts are from our Vogue series and the yellow t-shirts are from our revolutionary series. And so the winner, we will send one too. But what you have to do is you have to go to the website, quarantineracism.com, and you have to go to the tab that says anti-racism symposium. And you have to sign up 
It does require you to sign up. It requires you to give the e your email address, and then you have to confirm it. And then you want to go back to the forum that says quarantine racism strategic planning sessions and make your suggestion. And the winner we will reach out to and we will send you a free t-shirt. And so I'm gonna answer some questions in a minute, but I wanna talk and I wanna make sure you know that our next session will be next Thursday, October 24th at eight o'clock PM. Uh, we're gonna start having them every Thursday. And what I'm gonna discuss, so, because I don't have a winner this week, is what classroom survival skills can black parents teach to their children? And I included this picture because this is what happens sometimes when our kids are not taught how to interact and get favor from our teachers. We believe they should get the favor anyway, but there are certain strategies that you can actually teach your young people at school. We are on LinkedIn and we also are on Facebook as well. Uh, 